Hey guys, John from Scottsdale Living, and we're back here with the podcast today. And today we're talking to, it's going to be a really interesting conversation, talking to Brad, Dr. Josh, uh, both of the co-founders of CBD Companion, and you guys provide CBD uh, supplements for pets, right? Yeah, I mean, that's essentially what we do. I mean, we when CBD first came on scene mm -hmm. uh, about five or six years ago, at least it, it became available to people in mass. Um, we quickly realized that it had a lot of opportunity to manage conditions sure. that are more chronic in, in our dogs and cats. And actually, I should say these days, we're looking at other species as well that we deal with in veterinary right. medicine. And as a consequence, um, it also became clear that for us as veterinarians, one of the things that we're used to is the sort of one-size-fits-all strategy. You know, mm -hmm. we're given a drug. If you weigh this amount, you get this drug, regardless of what you're using the drug to treat. Sure. But the reality is it's not the case with cannabinoid medicine. Mm -hmm. There's too much variability. So we needed to get out there and create products that allowed pet owners and veterinarians to really treat a variety of conditions mm -hmm. in patients of varying sizes. You know, in, 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 on the human side, you know, somebody who's, let's say, 150 pounds and 200 pounds, there's not a huge difference in how you're going to be dosed sure. drug -wise. But if you're a five-pound chihuahua or a 150-pound <laughs> Great a Dane, right? there's a huge difference. Yeah. So you have to have products that are effective, that really pay attention to the science so that we can treat these patients effectively. So clear it, clear it up a little bit for everybody, because CBD, I, I mean, are the dogs all getting stoned? Is that where we're at? No, so, <laughs> <You know? laughs> right, we hope not. Yeah. Um, so the reality is that, that CBD is one of a group of compounds right. called cannabinoids. So the cannabinoids are number at this point well over 100 different compounds sure uh, typically these compounds are found in the hemp plant they're mm -hmm. found in other plants but mainly the hemp plant these days and of those you know people are most familiar with something called thc sure that's what gets you high right they're less familiar or i shouldn't say less familiar but they're now they're more familiar with cbd mm -hmm. um there are a variety of other compounds that are now sort of making their way on the market things like cbc cbn cbg but from a therapeutic perspective cbd really gained attention a number of years ago because of a little girl in Colorado, okay. little Charlotte, who had a rare seizure condition mm -hmm. that was not responsive to more traditional medication. And long story short, um, it was discovered that CBD can actually reduce the seizure frequency. Wow, that's amazing. So yeah. much so that there was a pharmaceutical company that actually developed an FDA approved product now mm -hmm. to manage this type of seizure activity in kids with these unusual seizure syndromes. Sure. And so I think in large part because of that, um, CBD gained a lot of attention. Yeah. And we're starting to see a lot of money, both on the human side and, and some more on the veterinary side, um, available to research the potential benefits. And of sure. course, that's expanding to not just the cannabinoids, but a variety of other compounds that are actually found in the hemp plant that may have some therapeutic value. Sure. So CBD is just one of this, compound, this group of compounds, but so far it's one of the better studied. Mm -hmm. And you know, because of this, this, this FDA-approved drug, it's one of those, these compounds that really is of all of them, a little bit more readily accepted by the medical community. Sure. Even though the use of cannabinoid medicine uh, is no longer on the fringes, it's still, I wouldn't describe it as mainstream. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it seems to be there's still a little bit of it. Is it more political that kind of keeps it from coming more mainstream? Or I, I don't know that I would describe it as political. I think it's confusion. Okay. You know, unfortunately, the regulatory bodies in the U.S., well, fortunately, they want to see enough evidence sure. that demonstrates that these compounds are both effective and safe at the same time. And mm -hmm. I think that what we've seen in the last, let's say five to eight years is a proliferation of research that's beginning to demonstrate this. Sure. Um, but again, this is also a natural product. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very flexible product. Again, it's different with respect to the way that we use it. I mean, uh, certainly in veterinary medicine, patients of different size mm -hmm. who have different conditions require different dosing strategies. Sure. sure. And this is not something that we're really accustomed to in medicine. Uh, not to mention the fact that whatever they do with respect to CBD really has to apply to this larger group, the cannabinoids, mm -hmm. because we're going to see more and more of these compounds come into play in the future. So I think there's a lot of con confusion, uncertainty, and, and perhaps not yet enough data to really justify full legalization. That said, you'll find both in the human literature and veterinary medicine that the CBD is a very safe product. Sure, It certainly does not produce the high associated with things like marijuana, Mm -hmm. uh, or THC. So um, in terms of the risks, I think they're relatively few, but I'm not in a position to make the rules. No, no, totally. So g give us an example of like what, what you're treating with your products. So some of the more common conditions, and, and we have to be careful certainly about using the word treat because the sure. FDA is very careful about, about the use of that word, but conditions that we tend to manage, I'd say at the top of the list are arthritic conditions. Okay. We have a lot of you know, older pets, dogs and cats, for example, sure. they'll get arthritis as they age. 
Um, we talk about its use to manage seizure activity. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a number of behavioral conditions, everything from anxiety relating to travel to what we in veterinary medicine term uh, separation anxiety. Mm-hmm. So we you know when you leave the home, your pets get very sure. anxious sure. and worried. Um, certainly, we're, we're starting to see evidence that perhaps it's effective in patients who have certain types of allergies. Mm-hmm. Uh, we certainly see that it has potential benefits. If we look towards the human side, um, there may be benefits with respect to patients who have certain types of cancer, um, patients who have certain types of you know, intestinal diseases. So sure. there's, there's a lot of opportunity here, but we haven't explored it enough to, to really right. know. So that's an ongoing thing. I would assume that there's a whole bunch of testing going Absolutely. on and, and that um, old idea. Certainly on the human side, you're actually seeing a lot of sort of studies sponsored at major sure. you know, medical schools. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective in veterinary medicine, much of that research is sponsored by companies who manufacture products. Yeah, of course. So you do have to look at that critically when they publish these studies and ask yourself, well, you know, are we getting uh, the cleanest data? Yeah. And What's the is advantage? the study lar- right? Is the study large enough, significant enough that we can take a- take something away from it and really apply sure. it in our patients? So is it? I mean, on the human side, the question there is like <laughs> you'll see it now at the grocery store, right? At the checkout right. line. So I mean, is that a similar product to what? May your doctor may be prescribing your naturopathic doctor. I mean, is that along the same lines? Similar, yes, but there okay. are some significant differences. I think one of the biggest challenges and one of the things that brought us into this this um, industry is the fact that a lot of products with CBD mm-hmm. are made in such a way that they can advertise as having CBD. Okay, but they but the amount of CBD falls well below the threshold oh, wow. at which it's actually effective. So it's a marketing or it's ploy. prepared in a product. Excuse me, that sure. it, that will be administered in an ineffective way. Gotcha. And so, you know, there was a rush. There, there was a gold rush in, in, in yeah, you know, yeah, when, when, when marijuana was, was you know, first legalized. Um, and it was a gold rush in the CB industry. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of products made it onto the market. But there was never any attention, nor was there any regulation to ensure these products were actually effective. Sure, sure. So how does this evolve? So, I mean, you know, 10 years ago, this is kind of an unknown treatment path, right? So <clears throat> interestingly enough, you know, the... Uh, the folks in the industry will talk about the fact that because marijuana, for instance, was, you know, federally prohibited, right? You know, there was not a lot of money available to fund research. Sure. Um, it's really, I would say in the last 10, perhaps even 15 years, we have seen this explosion of research into the cannabinoids. Um, me personally, I couldn't tell you what sort of, what spark ignited this, yeah, but yeah. certainly in 2018, when the federal government passed what we sort of referred to as the Hemp Act, mm-hmm. which made it more permissible to not only grow, but potentially sell products containing CBD, sure. as long as the amount of THC fell below their, their established threshold, it really opened up the doors to a lot more research, which is mm-hmm. now taking place. And of course, from that, we're also seeing research into things like psychedelics, you know, yeah, yeah. mushrooms, for example. Yeah, ketamines. And, and yeah. Exactly, ketamine, right. things that could potentially help people with a whole variety of conditions. So sure. it's exciting, but... Uh, it's been slow because we we sort of missed the boat for many decades. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you get in? I mean, how do you guys step into this? Because I mean, you ha- have been a salesman for in pharma or, uh, in medical, medical equipment device. for a long time, <laughs> medical device, and then as veterinarian, how do you guys put this thing together and, and start coming out with the product? So um, I think it was probably in 2018. Um, Brad came to me. He was working for a company, and the company was interested in looking at their products and how their this one particular product could actually be used in a population of pets and sure. would it be effective at managing pets who had arthritis mm-hmm. so we designed a study that we conducted at a variety of clinics around the country uh, using this product and we were gathering data back from pet owners as well as veterinarians sure. using tools within veterinary medicine that allows us to sort of pool the data and get a sense of, of whether we're really truly seeing a positive effect or not we did that and in fact there wasn't significant um, oh, wow, okay. improvement in, in, in noted both by veterinarians and by the pet owners. You know, we were constrained by this company's products and sure. what direction they wanted to go into. So from that, we decided, you know what, there are certain opportunities here that we think we could take advantage of and really provide products that could really do the job mm-hmm. that they need to be doing for sure. pet owners who own pets with chronic diseases. And that's what started the genesis of, of companion CBD. Uh, and so, you know, over time, we've sort of evolved a little bit to take advantage, to continue, I should say, take advantage of the research that's coming out to make sure the products are designed in a fashion that really gives the pet the most benefit. Sure. And at the same time, really makes it easy for owners to, you know, administer the product mm-hmm. uh, and make sure it's palatable. I mean, yeah, if yeah. they won't eat it, well, there's no point in, right. in giving yeah, it. Totally. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that was, you know, for example, one, you know, one of the biggest sort of, um, if you will, uh, issues had to do with the fact that, you know, a lot of products were oils, tinctures. Sure. 
Now, if you've ever tasted hemp oil, it's not the most palatable <laughs> thing. And if you had to give that chronically to a dog or a right. cat for a particular condition, it's not easy. And, you know, honestly, it sounds silly, but you don't want your dog thinking that every time you approach him yeah, yeah. or her, yeah. that you're going to wait from me. Yeah, yeah you're totally. going to give this nasty liquid. Right. Yeah. So it ruins the relationship. And so the products that we had to sort of design had to take all those things into consideration from the point of a clinician like myself who sees this every day when I work with my right. clients. Yeah. So the, the funny thing is like, so right now the products that you guys provide, it's not a prescription product, right? No. It's available <laughs> over the counter. Do you see a, a path to where it's either a stronger, a stronger product or there's some kind of prescription model to it? Because I would also think like a lot of the, what you treat is treated by prescription drugs, right? That, that veterinarians that yeah. prescribe. Yeah. I mean, you know, these days, you know, people are always looking for viable alternatives. Sure. You know, of course. there are circumstances where traditional medicine fails. Mm -hmm. um, there are circumstances where, um, you know, people themselves have concerns about the harmful effects and they mm -hmm. want to try to find something, you know, for lack of a better term, more natural. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there are some times when we throw everything we've got at a particular condition or disease and it's not enough. Mm -hmm. And so people want to sort of reach outside the box to look for something else that, if nothing else, sort of improves quality of life for a period of time. And so, you know, with CBD being an option for us as veterinarians. Yeah. I mean, it is something that we talk about in conversation more and more with, with pet owners because number one, they're aware of it. Sure. Many of them have already, you know, had ex yeah, personal experience with absolutely. it Two, you know, it can safely be administered with relatively few significant side effects. And mm -hmm. it's seemingly compatible with a lot of the more traditional medications we use. So it can be used as a sole agent or used as an adjunct to sure. other therapies. I think that, you know, where, where we go from here, in say five years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, truthfully, things could look very different in five years. You know, there's this concept, both on the human and veterinary side of something called the entourage effect, mm -hmm. where you, you take a mixture of compounds found in the hemp plant. And by administering those compounds together, potentially you get a, a more profound response sure. than if you gave just a single agent like CBD. And there are certainly issues. Kind of a super drug kind of thing. Kind going of, on, yeah. yeah. I mean, there are some it, certainly issues with that and we need to learn more about it. Um, but the possibilities here are very significant. And certainly, you know, these days, pets are living a lot longer than they used to. Right. You know, so we deal with a lot of chronic conditions. And, you know, one of the other considerations, which is worth mentioning, especially since we're talking about pets, is the cost. Yeah. You know, um, Absolutely. cutting edge veterinary medicine is expensive. Mm -hmm. And if we can find an, op excuse me, an option in cannabinoids mm -hmm. that's reasonably effective, safe, Right. And cost effective, it makes it a viable option both for, you know, the client and, and the pet. Yeah, absolutely. So it, we have a ton of business owners in the community in this part of the group. And th this is a really interesting business. So, I mean, this is a mass distribution of a product that you guys are, that you research and put together. And now you create and distribute and the whole thing. Walk me through that process a little bit. I mean, how do you guys go from, you know, doing a clinical study and then all of a sudden your manufacturers and packagers and distributors and, you know, where, where do you start? <laughs> well, basically, you know, <laughs> Josh did all the research on the back end, obviously sure. on the, on the clinical side regarding evidence-based actives and inactive ingredients came up with a, a product that uh, it's best to be administered easier, you know, instead of a tincture again, yeah, yeah. you know, something, a palatable, safe, cost-effective product. And that's exactly what we've, what we've done since, since the beginning. So we have, Veterinarians across the country that that retail our products. Well, so um, how do you get those guys on board? I mean, that's a great question. So in the beginning, prior to COVID, we we exhibited at veterinary medical conferences. Gotcha. Okay. So that's when we first launched the company in October of 2018. Mm -hmm. We did at a, at a veterinary conference. A couple months later, we actually um, went to Alonia, Italy, mm -hmm. at a worldwide. Uh, that conference retail kind of affair. So that's a pretty good little conference to go to. It right? was. It was. It was. It was very. It was really interesting to see the the, the acceptability of it, you sure. know, on a global basis. But of course, there was there were a lot of parameters there and and yeah. potential legalities. So did but, you find veterinarians from like Europe or Asia or whatever that were much more open to it? You know, it was a mix. I mean, you know, early on to in, in terms of crafting the product, you know, we look at the science. Yeah. Um, we formulate a, a strategy and, and design the products to meet the needs of patients, again, of, of varying sizes. You know, we work with with other folks in the sort of manufacturing industry to, sure. to produce those products. But, you know, veterinarians are a stubborn bunch. Sure. They, most of them tend to be type A personalities. And they're not easily swayed. Yeah. So 
here we do here we come along with this new medicine, new science. Right. Keep in mind the the way that the cannabinoid compounds like CBD work is through a system called the endocannabinoid system. Mm -hmm. We have it, dogs have it, you know, sea lions have it, sure. all mammals have it. But we're never taught anything about it. Right. Human docs are not taught about it. Veterinarians are not taught about it in school. And really up until about 15 years ago, um, most people had never heard of it. So you're dealing so, with guys that have zero knowledge of this whatsoever. Correct. So yeah. the, the starting point was to try to provide education. Sure. Because we needed to teach people about how these compounds work, through what sort of uh, receptors in the body, would they play well with other drugs. They needed to understand the science, the basic science, sure. the physiologic science, the biochemistry first, before they can embrace the idea of actually using them in clinical practice. Right. And truth be told, here we are five, six years later, and you know there's still resistance. It, it's not on the fringe like it used to be, but there's still resistance um, because again, you know, we're providing an education about a whole new science no one was ever exposed to. So it takes time to absorb that, integrate that into more traditional medicine. Absolutely. Again, that and th th this idea that we lack a sort of a one size fits all strategy when using these type of compounds. And again. We're talking about one compound made right. by CBD, yeah, yeah. but there are many others that fall into the same category. Um, it's a huge challenge. And so sure. people were leery of it. To your point earlier about you know federal regulation, the government's really not sure how they're going to regulate sure. this compound, but they've let a billion dollar industry grow up in yeah. spite of that fact. And so there are still many veterinarians out there who are leery of sort of discussing this with their clients. Mm -hmm. um, certainly some states up until recently, like California, had prohibitions against it. Sure. And... Kind of surprising. I think California yeah. would be one of the first adopters. You would think so. You yeah. would think so. So, you know, little by little, providing that education through different sort of platforms within veterinary medicine, we can expose people to the science, mm -hmm. teach them about how to use it actually in, in the clinic. And little by little, you know, we gain people's confidence sure. and trust. And I think one of the things that we've set out to do is, you know, even when I lecture to groups of veterinarians or veterinary professionals, make it very clear. We don't discuss our brand. We don't discuss anybody's brand. Yeah. We're strictly sticking to the published science. You know, and I honestly, at the end of the day, I think it lends some credibility. Yeah, totally, um, of course. We're not claiming that, that CBD is a panacea. Mm -hmm. We're not claiming that our products are the best products out there. Sure. Um, that said, you know, what veterinarians in particular are going to need to see over the coming years is more and more published literature. Yeah, yeah, of course. And as that begins to occur, I think we'll see even wider scale acceptance of cannabinoids in veterinary medicine. Right. So when you guys kick this off, what's, is that the game plan? Like, we're going to educate the veterinarians. We're going to get this information out there. And behind that is going to be the product that, you know, is part of the, part of the model. Obviously, there's competition and other people out there. But was that kind of the business plan? Yeah. It's like, let's go do this. Teach people about the science. Mm -hmm. And then provide products sure. that, you know, can meet the sort of therapeutic needs of these patients. Right. Uh, and leave it at that. I mean, the truth is... Um, the veterinary, excuse me, I shouldn't say the veterinary, the CBD world early on was dominated by many companies that were just trying to market a product. Yeah. It was the prettiest, it was the flashiest, it was the best financed. Right. But it didn't make it the most effective. And I think it got a little bit of a stigmatism to them because of that, perhaps, right? Perhaps. Yeah. So there was, a, like I said, there was a gold rush. Yeah. And we took a different approach, mm -hmm. especially since we were focused more on the veterinary community because, you know, luckily veterinarians are still considered to be a legitimate source of information sure. for pet owners on their pet's health care. So we felt like going through the veterinary community made more sense. And it would also provide a little bit more validity mm -hmm. to the arguments we were making for why cannabinoids could be used safely and effectively in treating a variety of conditions. Sure. So crazy side question, but I mean, there's a huge rush right now, obviously, for the average mm -hmm. person out there in the world to go to more of the naturopathic medicine, you know, for your own health. Do you see that in the veterinary world? I mean, are there more vets <clears throat> that are naturopathic kind of based? No. Okay. I mean, they still make up a small minority of veterinarians in the sort of veterinary community. Gotcha. I, I think, and, and I can't speak to human medicine here, but certainly I think veterinarians by and large are trained in such a way that they want to see the evidence. Right. And unless you can clearly substantiate uh, the reason for choosing a particular, uh, say, medication, drug, therapy, mm -hmm. and show why it works, uh, you're going to have a difficult time proving why somebody should choose, say, this alternative therapy over something more traditional. Sure. Now, that doesn't always resonate with some pet owners, and that's fine, and that's where you have other practitioners who will, you know, provide more, I suppose, what you call holistic services. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, um, you know, it, 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 CBD is moving away from that sort of 
arena right because we're seeing more and more published sure and it's an easier argument to make for two more veterinarians that yes in fact there is a body of literature that supports its use mm -hmm. uh, and guides you as to how to use it um, effectively in practice sure so now you'd mentioned earlier it's like a billion dollar business that's a cbd business right what percentage of that is is focused on veterinary medicine or on pets very small i mean okay. very, I, I don't have an exact number but it's, right. it's still a minority i okay. mean the truth is you know the the <laughs> the market for cannabinoid medicine admittedly is much larger i mean there are sure 300 plus million people in yeah, this yeah. country and there's yeah. about roughly you know 100 120 million pets right admittedly cannabinoid medicine can still be expensive mm -hmm. um, for a lot of folks and therefore it's not an option right. for many pet owners so you know we're still looking at a tiny slice of the overall market sure uh, nevertheless that's growing especially since the the cost to produce the cannabinoids and manufacture products containing them has come down so dramatically. So and is that a regulated industry? So like you guys have to go out and get CBD. You have to get your materials, the raw materials. Is that a regulated industry that goes through the, you know, like, like a pharmaceutical would, like, you know, any kind of drug? So the government isn't as involved as, involved as it perhaps should be okay. or needs to be. I, I'd say that currently there's a lot more self-policing. Okay. So when you go to somebody who produces, uh, let's say CBD, uh, specifically something um, known as a CBD isolate. So the mm -hmm. purified crystallized form of CBD. They put that product through a series of tests mm -hmm. to verify that it doesn't have any contaminants in it that would be harmful when you sort of take the end product. Sure. I mean, realistically, to be part of the industry at this point, it's a must. It's non-negotiable. And right. unless you can demonstrate that your product is really clean product, free of these contaminants, you have no business. Sure. So by virtue of the competition that's out there, the industry has evolved in a way to provide products that I think by and large tend to be safe. Sure. That said, it doesn't mean everybody is doing that. And they, right. what we found certainly very early on, and, and they, there are even published studies like in the Journal of the American Medical Association that demonstrate that a lot of products that you could have purchased off the shelf were contaminated yeah, yeah. You know, with a lot of things that ideally shouldn't be in there. Mm -hmm. Whether these companies knew that and ignored it or didn't know, either way, uh, what we found is that many of the more reputable companies have moved direction of actually being totally open mm -hmm. providing the data if you want to review it as, sure. a, as a potential cu customer to see what's actually going in to make that product you're buying right so your guys's business today tell us a little bit about where you're at where you're planning on going and how how it operates on a daily basis i mean is there are there employees working right <clears throat> now for you or are you guys doing this at night or are you packing during the day what's going on yeah it's 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 a full-time gig we're small we have a few independent reps sure. that uh, help us sell and uh we have strategic partnerships with uh, different avenues that help with the marketing and things. Mm -hmm. We're really in, in the position now to really scale the company sure. uh, on a global basis as well. So we have other evidence-based uh, product lines that Josh has designed that are that are ready to go right. uh, at the opportune time. Um, one thing I want to backward backtrack sure. is when we were talking about like the certificate of analysis legitimizing you know the CBD ingredient or the product. So many people, and I talk to people every day that think they're buying CBD on Amazon yeah, or even eBay. Well, it says it on Amazon. It I've well, seen this for it, some, it, a lot of it, stuff. It is frowned upon. It is illegal. <laughs> they do not allow CBD products to be sold okay. on those platforms. However, a lot of these other companies out there that are, you know, marketing companies, they'll have a, you know, it'll say hemp seed oil yeah, on yeah. it, which is not a CBD. Okay. Um, however, again, there's, there's a lot of people that are misinformed. So right. again, the, 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 the business model that we created from the beginning was, we can have the greatest product in the world, but bottom line is if we don't educate people, especially veterinarians to, you know, average pet owner, we don't have a viable business and we sure. don't have the, the credibility and the trust to, to, to scale that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. now after five years, we've been kind of, you know, flying low under the radar for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a proven model. We have a proven evidence-based award-winning product sure. line. And, um, you know, we're definitely ready to take it to, to the next level and get it into, you know, there's been a lot of interest in big box, mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, scale the veterinary market more, educate more now that people are out and about again. Um, obviously, with COVID, the, we weren't out exhibiting and, and uh, speaking at conferences sure. like we had. So it's, um, you know, like Josh said earlier, five years from now, I mean, this industry is going to be significantly different. Yeah, there's absolutely. there's well over 100 compounds, you know, that um, that show promise, but it's quantifying that and determining what they are right. and how to effectively do that. But, you know, we focus right now solely on CBD mm -hmm. and it's working. And until we, you know, as everything evolves, um, that's, that's the plan moving forward. Sure. 
So it's got to be a battle to separate yourselves being, you know, with a legitimate product, with research, with everything behind it and everything you put into it versus, because I've done this, I mean, versus the guy in Amazon that's selling something that helps your dog's joints that says hemp seed oil on it, that literally did nothing for my dog that I could notice. And I mean, obviously I couldn't ask him, but he didn't ask, he didn't act any differently, right? So, I mean, I, I would assume that, that pet supplements is a totally non-regulated wide open arena that you just got to separate yourself from. So, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, the amount of regulation that exists is far less than what we need. Sure. You know, to be truthful, our product would probably only appeal to the discerning pet owner. Mm -hmm. And I say that because you can go online and Google pet CBD. Yeah. And you can get 100 different products. But somebody who wants to use CBD and have it really make a difference in that pet's quality of life uh, is willing to dig a little deeper and discover that, hey, you know what? The dose requirements for my 100-pound dog are probably not the same as my 10-pound chihuahua. Yeah, yeah, right. And in understanding that, they realize, you know what? What I'm being offered from this website. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Because, you know, you're asking me to give 5 milligrams in a dog treat, but my dog needs 100 milligrams yeah. twice a day. Right. Well, that means I'm giving 40 of these treats right. twice a day. Right. It doesn't make any sense, economically or otherwise. So I, I think a discerning pet owner a pet owner that's really sort of, you know, that considers their pet part of the family is the customer that appeals, that, that would embrace our product. The sure. most. Um, we're not the right product for everybody. That said, from the standpoint of a veterinarian, because we formulate the products in a way that allows them to dose pets of different sizes and with different conditions, mm-hmm. they have the flexibility within a relatively small number of products to treat the patient, patients as they need to be treated. Sure. Sure. So, but yes, to be perfectly honest, it's a hard thing to differentiate ourselves when you have, you know, so much out there saying, hey, we're great. Look at us. You know, our products are amazing. The distribution channel through the veterinarian community has got to be just (laughs) key, right? I mean, that's got to be a really good thing to have. It is. You you know, know, recommended by so many vets. Sure. I mean, it is. But again, you know, certainly in veterinary medicine, we're faced with a sort of a a new set of challenges with the corporatization of our our profession. I was going to ask you about that. That's been happening a lot. (laughs) Getting into, you know, practices is a bit more of a challenge than it would have been, say, 10 years ago. Um, But it's still possible. And, you know, as cannabinoid medicine is more warmly embraced by a larger segment of the, the profession, I think we'll see more and more practices willing to certainly carry it. Sure. And, you know, a little bit off tangent, right? But the, my veterinarian just got bought out not too long ago. So what's going on? With, is it just really super expensive to be a vet at this point in time? Or is it just the, it's a profitable arena? So why are these all these veterinarians getting bought out? So, you know, veterinary medicine <laughs> was a very, at times, is still considered to be a very fragmented industry. Okay. You have a lot of folks who, you know, set up shop, put their shingle out, start practicing. But as veterinarians, we're trained to practice veterinary medicine. Mm-hmm. We're not, we were never trained to run a business by sure. and large. Yeah, yeah. And so many businesses, many practices were not run very efficiently. Sure. They made money. Everybody got to pay their bills. Everybody took home, you know, money and, and hopefully made a decent living. And obviously there were folks now, you know, 10, 15 years ago that saw the opportunity mm-hmm. to leverage an economy of scale. Yeah, yeah. Um, more streamlined you know, purchasing. Yeah, they went the McDonald's uh, path, whatever. Yeah, totally, exactly. 100%. Um, and of course, you know, when private equity got hold of this, sure. the amount of money that's come into veterinary medicine in the last 10 years has been just tremendous. Yeah. So much so that, you know, uh, these corporations, what we call the, the consolidators, you know, were offering practice owners enormous sums of money uh, for their practices. Sure. Um, but unfortunately, um, there's always a trade-off with that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Certainly for a lot of basic services, it may work. But, um, you know, when you're working for a big corporation, especially one that's private equity backed, they have certain targets to meet and a time horizon to do so. Well, they're selling now. (laughs) I mean, that's what happened to my vet. They're selling to me now. Right. And of course, they're not treating the dog. They're selling to me. Right. And up until recently, you know, interest rates were low. So people could borrow very easily and invest and pay enormous sums for these practices. Um, So, I mean, there's been a change in veterinary medicine, certainly with COVID, uh, you know, we're starting to see the sort of emergence of, you know, telehealth services. Sure. In fact, the state of Arizona passed a law effective uh, August 1st of this year that that sort of makes telehealth services more permissible. It tries to set some boundaries or guidelines sure. for, for the use of those services. And we're likely to see more of this because there are, you know, a lot of corporations that are spending a lot of money uh, and, and, you know, paying for lobbyists to make oh, yeah, the case yeah. to both state and federal government that there should be allowed 
you know, where things go from here, I think, is anybody's guess. Sure. But, um, you know, are there, is there always going to be a place for practitioners who treat their staffs well, treat their clients well, and treat the patients? Yeah, of course. You know, absolutely, with it, yeah. There absolutely will be. And I'm um, looking for that one right now, by the way. So <laughs> you recommend me a good one. I'd love it. Yeah, but to go back to Companion CBD, <laughs> you know, great talking to you guys. If somebody wants to go out and find your stuff right now, where can they go? So you can go online, companioncbd.com. Okay. Um, that's, we have our e-commerce platform. Mm-hmm. Um, for those uh, Scottsdale Living members or people that hit the website, if you use the code PAWS, it's P-A-W-S, all in caps, we'll give you a special discounted uh, first-time offer. Love it. Thank you. Um, cool. Another thing, too, that's really, really important that we didn't discuss is we have a component to our business. It's called Ask a Vet. It's like a veterinary saw concierge. That. So it's a free vet service. Yeah. Free so once again, so if you are looking to potentially look at CBD as an option for your pet, you can go to our website, companioncbd.com, click on the Ask a Vet feature, and you can ask a question, and we'll get back to you literally within hours. A veterinarian will contact you either through email, if you need to set up a phone call. We'll even speak with your own veterinarian to collaborate to give you the best you know, treatment option. So that's a big, big deal for us over the years and a differentiator. Cause sure. again, it's like you buy this product and you know, it's like, what do I use it for? How do I dose it? Bottom line is, you know, one thing that I'm super proud to say about the company over the last five years is, you know, I think we've taken back, I think six people have returned product. Oh man, that's fantastic. Six. I mean, yeah, you know, and, and I say that with a smile because right. it's, it's a big deal. Yeah. But we work. We you know each one of those six too. Don't I you? do. I do. One of them was my neighbor who, yeah. uh, interestingly enough, is a physician, but he wasn't yeah. giving it. He wasn't dosing it the right, right. way. You got to give it twice a day for it to be clinically effective. Sure. So again, you know, we recognize that not everyone's compliant. Right. But, you know, again, we're here to help. This, sure. That's what we do as, as a company. And that's how, again, we have the credibility and we differentiate by taking this as an individualized approach for every pet say, listen, if you don't see a desired result within a week to 10 days, contact us back. There's right. no charge. And we're going to, we need to tweak the dose. We can titrate the dose higher. It could be lower. That's, it's not a one size fits all proposition sure. like Josh has mentioned. And it's not a cure all, but you got to be patient. It's a little bit of trial and error. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, this, this, this person that returned it last, that was about a month ago, July 4th. Yeah. She calls like two days before July 4th. She's like, I got this crazy terrier. It goes crazy over fireworks. Is it going to work? I said, well, it can. Yeah. But here's what you need to do. And it may not work exactly on July 4th in three days. Yeah. But this is what you need to do. So literally, uh, you know, she gave one dose and she gave half of what we, what I, what we said. Yeah. It didn't work. So she's like, I want my money back. Said, no problem. Send short. it back to us. Right. So again, you know, you're always going to have challenging clients. But overall, we have uh, our, our client base is very loyal. We have tons of uh, positive reviews on our website. And Fantastic. bottom line is we're here about, we're here to help. Yeah. So, so guys, again, this is John with Scottsdale Living talking to Dr. Josh and Brad, companioncbd.com, right? Correct. And uh, we'll post everything on the YouTube links and on the page as well. But thanks a lot for joining us, guys. You got anything to add in there before, before we check off? Thanks for having us. Um, Absolutely. It's been great today. I, I think that... Um, you know, folks are interested in using CBD to, to manage a particular condition. As Brad pointed out, using the Ask a Vet feature is helpful. Sure. Um, you know, even if uh, a veterinarian or your veterinarian is not familiar with how best to employ it, um, they can contact me directly and we can have a conversation. And they can, you know, your veterinarian can in turn manage um, your pet's condition uh, along with somebody who has, you know, maybe a little bit more experience using sure. the cannabinoids. Excellent. Thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Have for a great us. day, folks.